my name is Aaron Topance. I live up north in Davis County. Um, typically, uh, I'm involved with the Ogden Area Linux Users Group. Uh, we're a much smaller group than, than Plug is. I work for XMission in downtown Salt Lake. I am a full-time systems administrator, largely in Ubuntu shop with some CentOS mixed in and some other stuff. Uh, I also teach part-time at the University of Utah. I teach a Linux certification course uh, up there as well. Tonight I'm going to be talking about uh, some basic crypto. This is the presentation that I gave at the Utah Open West Conference back in May. Uh, however, I'm going to give you an enhanced version. Uh, I gave two presentations on cryptography at the Open West Conference. Uh, and I had to split them into two because I was only limited to an hour apiece. Uh, I, if it's all right with you, I'm going to go a little bit longer than an hour. So maybe we'll get out roughly around nine, I'm guessing, if that's okay. Uh, I'm going to take some stuff from that second talk and add it into this one. I think it's very important and relevant uh, to the discussion at hand. Uh, crypt before I begin, cryptography is a hobby of mine. I'm mostly interested in hand cryptography, like uh, pencil and paper stuff, spies, World War II agents, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, what drew me to that was Bruce Schneier created a playing card cipher algorithm that he called the solitaire cipher that uses a standard deck of playing cards. Uh, I was so intrigued by that that I developed my own encryption algorithm with a deck of playing cards. And I've since learned six others. And so I've created a repository on playing card encryption algorithms. Uh, and that's where most of my focus sits. It's just how to break those, how to analyze any patterns or any uh, structure to the ciphertexts that they produce. Uh, but aside from that, I do have strong, strong interests in modern computer cryptography. And that's what I'm going to focus on today. I'm not going to bore you with playing card ciphers. So my name is Aaron Toponce. That's my email address. Um, before I begin, I always license my presentations under the Creative Commons license. Uh, if any of you are interested in this presentation, let me know, and I can get you a copy. All right. So this was the introduction I had, uh, the original introduction that I had at Open West. I'm going to cover symmetric and asymmetric encryption. We'll talk about encryption and decryption, how they work, signatures and verification. We'll look at the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Uh, we'll look briefly at the SSL handshake, then different SSL and TLS versions. And then I'll close with some open SSH and open PGP concepts. What I'm going to add that I did not get in this talk at OpenWest are the following. Some problems with block cipher modes. Uh, we'll talk about three core definitions of confidentiality, integrity, and authentication. And then I'll look at uh, ways of encrypting and authenticating data, which is known as MAC then encrypt, encrypt and MAC, and then finally encrypt then MAC. By the way, this is going to be a very beginner talk. Uh, I have lots of pictures. You're not going to need to know any complex math or anything. Uh, everything you'll need to know is contained here in the slides. So let's first start with symmetric encryption. Symmetric encryption is probably what we typically think of as day-to-day, run-of-the-mill encryption and decryption. I create a secret. I encrypt my message with that secret and I send that encrypted message off to you. Somehow I've communicated uh, that secret to you out of band in a different channel, maybe via email or I called you on the phone. Uh, but you have that secret. You apply that secret to my encrypted message and you get back to your original plain text. Okay? So uh, there's a lot of encryption algorithms that are based on symmetric encryption. Uh, there's what we call rotational ciphers. These are things like the Caesar cipher, where we rotate the alphabet by a fixed offset. Uh, common that you're probably familiar with is ROT13, where you just shift the, the alphabet exactly 13 characters. So A becomes N, O become, or B becomes O, and C becomes P, and so forth, right, through the alphabet. Uh, standard rotational cipher. 
there's substitution ciphers where rather than just rotating the alphabet, we mix it. A common cipher in this uh, field is called the at bash, uh, the at bash cipher. There's other classical hand or field pencil and paper ciphers from the Vic cipher to the Visionaire cipher to the Pigeon cipher to the Bacon. Yes, there is a Bacon cipher. Um, and even like the playing card ciphers that I mentioned. Probably the strongest, uh, well definitely, absolutely, the strongest symmetric encryption algorithm out there is the one-time pad. First discovered in use in 1888, but the one-time pad requires that you create a truly random key that is exactly the length of the message. And then you exclusive or, which is or you can do a modular edition basically, of the plain text with that key and you will get a true random ciphertext. This is the goal of every cryptographer is for that ciphertext to have, be completely truly random. Zero structure, zero patterns, uh, zero information leak, completely and truly random noise. Only the one-time pad produces this, uh, if it's executed correctly, that is. More modern symmetric ciphers include the Advanced Encryption Standard, AES. This is what we're using 99 times out of 100 uh, when you're encrypting your data between you and your bank or your email or your VPN connection. More, more often than not, it's going to be using AES. An older standard is called Triple DES, the Data Encryption Standard. Uh, the initial data encryption standard had a 56-bit uh, uh, key length, and the EFF built a custom computer to show that this wasn't long enough, that we could brute force DES in practical time. So they tripled the key length and called it triple DES. Uh, and there are no actual practical security weaknesses or compromises with DES. It's still strong, but it's slow, it has a complicated key schedule, and it's basically been superseded by AES, which has a larger security margin. So no one in practice runs triple DES anymore. Uh, Blowfish is another one by a famous cryptographer named Bruce Schneier. Uh, if any of you are familiar with his book, Applied Cryptography, he also has a blog, Schneier on security. Uh, anyway, he wrote uh, Blowfish, Two Fish, and Three Fish. <laughs> if you're familiar with the One Fish, Red Fish, Two Fish, Blue Fish, kind of follows that paradigm. Uh, so here it is basically visually, right? I take my plain text. We're sharing a same key. By applying that key to the plain text, I get the cipher text. By applying the same key, I can reverse the process. Really, that's symmetric encryption. Pretty straightforward, not a lot to it. With symmetric encryption, we have what are called block cipher modes. Uh, there's two types of symmetric encryption. There's what's called block ciphers, and then there's called stream ciphers. Stream ciphers will work on the data a character at a time or a byte at a time, where a block cipher will set aside a block of bytes and then work on this block blocks at a time. Okay? It's really the only difference. With block ciphers, we have different ways on how to handle, uh, how to handle this encryption and decryption. I'm not going to go over all these, but I'm going to go over several. Um, so let's look at a few of those. This is called electronic code block, or ECB. Uh, and this is how it is applied. I take my block of plain text, say it's 128 bits or 64 bits, whatever the, uh, the block size is for the symmetric algorithm. And then I apply my key, and I will get the resulting 64-bit uh, or 128-bit ciphertext, right? And I, do, I can split this up into 16, 20, however many long my message is, right? It's just the multiple of uh, my plain text. So that it will need to be padding at the end. But regardless, uh, I can do these a piece at a time, which means I can parallelize this. If I'm going to work on 15 blocks, I can set aside 15 threads to each work on them individually. I don't need to wait for one thread to finish before starting the second, right? And decryption is just the reverse. ECB is simple, uh, it's fast, it just works. This is called uh, cipher block chaining, or CBC. This is a little more complex. CBC uses what's called an initialization vector. 
This initialization vector is a block that's the same size as the rest of the blocks that you're using in your algorithm. This symbol here is called the exclusive or. So I'm going to take my block of plain text, exclusive or it with my initialization vector. That result I'll send through the block cipher encryption, right? AES or triple des, whatever this is, and get my cipher text. This resulting ciphertext block becomes the quote unquote initialization vector for the next block, right? And we work in that, in that manner. And of course, decryption is, is the opposite. What's interesting is any changes in the initialization vector or the plain text get propagated throughout the entire algorithm, right? Unlike ECB, where it was entirely self contained, with CBC, a small change uh, creates an avalanche effect throughout the, the process. We'll see there is a hiccup with this, and I'll show that to you in a sec. This is called cipher feedback. Actually, it should be CFM. Uh, cipher feedback mode. CFB, I guess, works too. Um, rather than using my initialization vector and plain text XORT here, I just encrypt the initialization vector. Then as a result, I'll take the result of that encryption and XOR it with my plain text to get my ciphertext, which then I repeat the process. Okay? You can see there's just a subtle difference where with my CBC, the plain text and IV are XORed, then encrypted, where here, the IV is encrypted, then that result is XORed with the plain text to get the, the output. Okay? And then, of course, the reverse on the decryption. Here's what's called output feedback mode. There's a subtle difference with cipher feedback versus output feedback. With cipher feedback, the cipher text is being fed as my input to the next sequence of events. With output feedback, I get the output of the encryption of the initialization vector. So with cipher feedback, I'm, f I'm feeding my next block from here. With output feedback, I'm feeding it before the exclusive OR. One problem with output feedback mode is it is patented. Uh, the patent holder has gone ahead and released uh, open source uh, uses. OpenSSL has a, a patent agreement, if you will, where they can use it without having to pay the patent holder. Uh, and he's allowed some other uses for his, his algorithm. But as a result of the patent, most cryptographers will shy away from patented algorithms unless they're willing to pay, which a lot of people aren't. Uh, so you won't find output feedback mode used a lot uh, because of that result, so, which is kind of unfortunate. This is called counter mode. Counter mode looks very, very similar to ECB mode. You'll notice that everything is self-contained. Uh, nothing gets propagated from one to the next. The only difference is that we have a counter that increments by one for each block. Okay? Now in this case, we're applying what's called a nonce to the counter. A nonce is a random number that's used only once. Okay? It's never ever repeated. Um, you could use just a raw nonce to start, just as long as you increment that nonce by one as you move through. Or you could just start with zero and count up uh, as well. Or you could start with some random point. The point is, though, that you're taking a counter, a number, that is the same block size as what you're working with, and that gets encrypted. The result XORed with the plain text to get your cipher text. You increment that counter by one and do the process again. As you can see, this can be heavily parallelized and uh, for both the encryption and the decryption. Counter mode is pretty much the de facto standard. I would say maybe with CBC mode as a close second. Um, the reason why is because of uh, CTR. First off, because of the parallelization, it's fast, right? Again, I can open up as many threads as I need to to work on it in parallel. Uh, but second, ECB mode actually has a pretty difficult hurdle to get over, and I'm going to show you that in a sec. Counter mode doesn't have that problem. So counter mode has become the, the champion of block cipher encryption modes. 
So you'll usually hear in crypto circles when you're encrypting something, encrypt it with, quote, AES in counter mode. That's what we're talking about here. All right, so let's talk about the problems with ECB mode. I took the plug logo off of plug.org. I hope it's under a permissible license. <laughs> well, I'm going to use it. Uh, and I ran these commands. The, the logo was actually a PNG file, so I converted it to a bitmap. And then I used OpenSSL to encrypt it. Uh, so I'm using OpenSSL. I want to encrypt my file. I'm going to use AES 128-bit in ECB mode. AES is standardized in three bit lengths, 128-bit, 192-bit, and 256-bit. Okay? I'm just going to use 128 uh, in this example. I'm going to bring in the plug logo as the bitmap format. And then my encrypted output, I'll name ecb.bmp. I'll do the same with CBC mode to create a cbc.bmp. And what these create is random data dumps, right? They're not images after I encrypt them. It's binary garbage. So I need to make it an image. Thankfully, with the venerable DD, I can do that. Bitmap files have a 54-byte header. So I can read that 54-byte header. Oh, I forgot to change. As you can see, I did this for Open West. I thought I was good. Um, I'm going to take the 54-byte header off of pluglogo.bmp and apply it to these ecb and cbc.bmp files. That way, I can open them up in an image utility and see what they look like, right? Uh, and then I'll convert them to PNG files so my browser can actually show them. For whatever reason, it doesn't want to show BMPs. So here we go. There's the plug logo. Here it is encrypted with ECB mode. Here it is encrypted with CBC mode. Do you see why ECB mode is a problem now? The problem is, if I take something, like say this white block of data, if I'm encrypting it with the same key, ECB mode guarantees that the output will always be the same. As long as the input is the same, the output will be the same. So in, as a result, structure is maintained. Right? Compl and you can see that clearly. But with CBC mode, a single change propagates throughout the entire algorithm. And that is shown here. This looks like true random garbage. Where this, I can see structure to it. Does that make sense? There's another example on Wikipedia of ECB mode using the uh, Tux Penguin, the Linux logo. And it's a little bit better than my plug example. But Isn't that one black and white? No, it's, it's color. Yeah, it's color. Yep. So, so that's the problem with ECB. Uh, now, I want to address a problem with CBC mode. But before I do that, I, I need to get some definitions cleared up. So let's talk about some definitions. There's confidentiality, integrity, and availability. This is known as the, uh, the CIA triad. If you're in government, if you ever work for the government, they've got this really stupid looking logo that someone clearly with no graphic design skills built. Um, just do a search for the CIA triad. You'll see it. It's just ugly as sin. Uh, but anyway, the CIA triad talks about how these three things are integral uh, for security, for securing information or securing systems. There's confidentiality, which limits access. In our case for encryption, that's going to be encryption. That's going to be the block cipher mode, taking plain text, creating cipher text. Integrity makes sure that the accuracy of the data remains intact, right? That there's, there's no uh, compromise to the integrity of the system. There's no compromise to the integrity of the message. Uh, so in our case, with encryption, this is handled by what's called secure hashing algorithms. I don't cover secure hashing algorithms in this talk. That's a whole other beast that we could go through. Uh, but you've probably heard of some like MD5 or SHA-1, or SHA-256, uh, these, or SHA-512. These are secure hashing algorithms. Okay? They, uh, when you put in a data as input, they create a static length output 
that represents like a fingerprint of sorts of that input. As long as the input is the same, you'll always get the same fingerprint. Okay? So if the fingerprint is different than what I'm expecting, I know the input has changed. So that's where we're talking about integrity. Availability really doesn't concern us much here in crypto. It's more of a systems thing where I make sure the network is up to provide access to the information, or I make sure that I've got sufficient power uh, it's worth. You're probably familiar with the term high availability. In the event of an outage, how can I guarantee that my systems are resilient and that customers can access the data? Uh, that's what availability in the CIA triad uh, approaches. But in terms of encryption, in terms of cryptography, the, real, the two we're going to concern ourselves with are confidentiality and integrity. Confidentiality will be done through encryption. Okay. And integrity will be done through what's called authentication. Uh, authentication is an agreement between two parties, uh, whether it's like a, an agreed key, for example. Right? If Steve and I agreed on a private key tonight at the message, or tonight at the meeting, and then tomorrow I send Steve a message with that key, uh, if it decrypts with that key, he knows I'm the one that sent it to him. That's the type of authentication we're talking about. Uh, authentication provides only integrity, doesn't provide any confidentiality. I can sign a court order that's in plain text and to show that the court order has not been manipulated with, the accompanying signature will get verified. Okay. So it only provides integrity, doesn't provide any uh, confidentiality. So now knowing that, let's go back to cipher blockchaining. Here it is as a review. Okay, or encryption or decryption. There's a problem with this, and if you look carefully at the decryption step, you might be able to see it. Notice that if I make any change to a byte or a block, a byte or a bit in this block, right, this will go through the decryption mode, XORD. This will likely completely change the outputting plain text. If I make a simple change, I'm not very likely with high degrees of probability, I'm not going to get what I'm expecting. Okay? But look where that change later gets applied. After the next mode. So if I change the first byte here, okay, then as a result of this output, this is the only byte that's going to remain changed due to this exclusive war. Everything else will remain the same. To show this a little bit better with color, here we are. I wish to change this bit. I change it. My plain text is now garb garbage. It's garbled. It's binary data. I have no idea what happened. I don't know what it is. But that change as a result of CBC decryption gets brought here due to the exclusive or. All these will fall into place. The only one that will be different is the byte I changed. But then notice, it doesn't get propagated anywhere else, does it? Why is this a problem? Well, first off, if I come back to here, this is just confidentiality, right? I have something that's ciphertext. I have a key. I want to decrypt it and get back to plain text. There's no integrity here. Had there been integrity, if this would have changed, I could have caught that before I started my decryption. And I would have said, wait a minute, something's wrong. It's going to fail. Okay? But because I don't have authentication, I'm not going to be able to detect that flip. So what are some valid attacks, practical attacks I can use with this? I can do a man in the middle attack. I can inject a single bit on a bit that I want to flip uh, to create some desired result on the other side and it will go completely undetected. Or if I just want to screw up a person's connection, I don't want him to have access to the server, I can basically do those bit flips to create garbage. He's not going to get what he wants. But what's more, I think, interesting is this bullet point here. We could bypass filters, we could do other miscreant activities, but elevating privileges and session cookies. How many here are web developers? few. How many are familiar with session cookies? Yes, right? So let's say I have a session cookie, and in the cookie I've got 
an identifier that recognizes you as an unprivileged user to the web interface. You don't get admin controls, okay? But the admin, let's say that identifier is zero, by the way. But the admin's identifier is one, okay? As an attacker, even though it's encrypted data on the wire, I can grab a valid session cookie, first off, before we set up the HTTPS, and see, oh, here's my zero. This is an offset of 16 bytes, okay? I'm gonna flip that bit and see if I get a one, and see if I get admin access. If I don't get it, I try again. It's only a bit, or maybe a byte. At most, I've got eight bits to flip, and I've got access to a, an admin web interface, right? Just by hijacking an encrypted connection because there was no integrity, there was no signature on that cookie. This is a problem. So, how do we solve it? Well, here's, so here's uh, some attacks you could do with confidentiality when no integrity is applied, okay? Or pardon me, integrity without authentication. So remember how I mentioned authentication is two people agreeing on a secret, right? Well, what if I just did a blind applied a signature to a file, an encrypted file. I used SHA-1, for example. I have my ciphertext, I apply SHA-1, and I ship the, the ciphertext and the signature off together. So the result, the person can take the ciphertext, he can also hash it with SHA-1. If the two hashes match, there hasn't been any changes in the input, right? The problem with this is a man in the middle could take that and inject his own ciphertext with his own valid signature. You wouldn't know any different because you would take the ciphertext, hash it, see the signatures match, and attempt to do the decryption. Okay. So what the authentication is, well, could we use a key with SHA-1 that, again, Steve and I agreed on? Then, when Steve wants to verify the signature, he uses that key in that verification process. He's the only one that has it. The man in the middle doesn't. So if he tries and injects his own ciphertext with his own fingerprint applied, when Steve tries to verify it with that key, it'll fail, right? Because of that key. Now, if he didn't have the key, sure, it'd come through. But the attacker doesn't have access to that. It's only Steve and I agreed on that. So that is integrity with authentication. Without authentication, we're vulnerable to these sorts of attacks. Chosen prefix attacks, length extension attacks, replay attacks, uh, oracle attacks. This actually has been a problem. Remember Poodle? With SSL and TLS, it was, what, just a year ago? That was due to this problem, give or take, All right? But confidentiality with authentication. The plain text is encrypted, then it's digitally signed. But it's digitally signed with the key that two parties agreed on, secretly out of band in private. We call this authenticated encryption with associated data. You've probably seen AEAD applied to some cipher suites. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about authenticated encryption. Not only has the encryption been encrypted with a shared secret, it's been signed with the shared secret, okay? There are three ways of accomplishing this. What's called MAC, then encrypt, encrypt and MAC, and then encrypt, then MAC. Let's look at each of these piece by piece and see uh, the difference about them. First, a MAC is called a message authentication code. Typically, they're referred to in layman speak as MAC tags. Okay? You apply a MAC tag to the end of your, uh, your message, usually is how, it, how it's done. So an agreed upon key is determined, and then we take a long message of arbitrary length, and we hash it using a hash function with that key, right? The resulting digest is what we call a MAC tag. Um, there are, that's bullet points should go on the next slide, but there are a few MAC tags that we can apply. There's something called CBC MAC, HMAC, OMAC, PMAC, UMAC, VMAC, and then this new one by uh, uh, DJB, Daniel J. Bernstein, Poly1305. Uh, these are all different ways to create MAC tags, and I'm not going to cover the algorithms. By and large, 
almost universally you'll see HMAC used. It's a hash-based MAC um, authentication code, which means we'll use SHA-1 or SHA-256 uh, to handle that MAC tag. Okay? Uh, in fact, if I were to write this down, put this on a board, let's say I have a message, if that'll work, right? Some message, my tag would be, uh, well, let's first look at just the standard digest, okay? Would be something like the SHA-1 of that message. But the problem is, again, I can put any message here, and if I just say, well, let's just ship off, this marker's not working very well. Let's, wow, fail. I don't want to use red. Better. Let's just ship off the message plus the digest to the recipient as one bundled package, right? So you can take the message, apply the same algorithm, see if the digest matches. We already saw the problem with this. So with HMAC, instead, I'll have my message. Again, we'll say it's encrypted with the uh, key K, right? And then I'm going to do what's called an HMAC SHA-1, which will take my message, but also hash it with that key or a separate key. Because only two parties have access to this key, I can now ship off M plus D as a packaged box, and no one can interrupt that. If someone does, I'll detect it, because when I try and apply the message that I've now received from some attacker, with my K, the digest won't match what he supplied. That'll only match if he has access to that key. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? So that's what we're talking about with MAC tags. Okay. All right. So let's look at MAC then encrypt. So MAC then encrypt, I wonder if I can make that, I doubt it. Let's see, bigger. There we go. So with Mac then encrypt, I'm going to take my plain text, apply my hash function, whatever it is, okay, creates my Mac tag. I'll bundle these together as a single message, send them through to the encryption process with the same key that I'm going to use on my hash function. That's typically what we'll do. We'll use a single key. And I'll get my resulting ciphertext. Does that make sense? So I'm first applying the Mac then I'm encrypting the result, okay, with this shared key. Um, the problem with this is, is there's no ciphertext integrity, right? When I get the ciphertext, I don't know if this plain text is valid until after I've done the decryption process. Then I'll have the plain text and the tag. I can separate them, hash the plain text, and see if it matches the tag. So I have plain text integrity, because that was hashed, but I don't have any ciphertext integrity. Uh, it's not that this is a bad thing. Uh, there have been some papers that have shown some weaknesses with this approach. Uh, what's interesting is it's used by OpenSSL. OpenSSL doesn't have any weaknesses at all. It's been perfect, right? Uh, but that's Mac then encrypt. Here is encrypt and MAC. With encrypt and MAC, I'll take my plain text message and I will encrypt it and I will hash it. Then I will take that resulting tag and append it to the ciphertext. Okay? The hash should look like true random data. It shouldn't have structure. That's the point of these cryptographic algorithms. Uh, so with the encrypt and MAC, I'll apply the MAC tag at the end of the the ciphertext. Again though, look, no ciphertext integrity. I have plain text integrity because that got hashed. But again, I don't have ciphertext, so I have to decrypt. We'll first take the MAC tag off, then decrypt, hash the result, and see if they match. Uh, by default, the, well, this used to be the default in old versions of OpenSSH. They've since changed their tune but it is still available in OpenSSH, right? The next is encrypt then MAC. 
with encrypt then Mac, I encrypt the plain text. I'll get my ciphertext. I hash the ciphertext to get my Mac tag. Okay. With this, I have ciphertext integrity because the ciphertext was what was hashed, not the plain text. As a result, I get plain text integrity for free, right? Because any changes in the ciphertext will fail the verification of the Mac tag, but will also corrupt the plain text. There's no way around it. So with encrypt then Mac, I get that for free. Turns out most cryptographers like this approach. It's a more conservative, safer approach on doing Mac tags. Uh, and as a result, it's defined as a ISO IEC standard. There's the number there. Um, and it is used wholly in IPsec, if you use that for uh, VPNs or other tunneling. And, <laughs> OND, OND, it's used in OpenSSH you'll notice in the cipher it'll have appended dash etm, which stands for encrypt then Mac. The dash etm ciphers in OpenSSH are now the default, but the encrypt and Mac are still available if you want to use those instead. So any questions on Mac then encrypt, encrypt then Mac, or encrypt then Mac? All good? All right. So let's, let's move forward then to with asymmetric encryption. I'm actually going a lot faster than I expected. <laughs> um, so with these block cipher modes, these apply primarily to symmetric encryption. The CBC, the ECB, all that stuff, these are all uh, symmetric block cipher modes. Uh, and these MAC tags are also very symmetric cipher-ish. With asymmetric encryption, things change. Symmetric encryption, we had a shared key, right? Two parties agreed on a key. That's what they use for the encryption and the decryption. With asymmetric encryption, things change. This was invented by um, Martin Diffie and Whitfield Hellman. I might have their names reversed. Uh, Diffie and Hellman. These are kind of the fathers of what's called public key cryptography. And the idea is that rather than generating a single key and sharing that key, we'll generate a private secret. And then from that private secret or from the algorithm, we'll generate a public key. We'll also make it impossible or practically impossible to derive the private key from the public. Okay. Turns out there are some weaknesses here, but I want to address those. <coughs> so, we have a private and a public key system. The idea is that I hold on to my private key, but I distribute the public key freely. Anyone who wants it can have access to it. Okay? And the same would be true for everybody in this room. You would have a private key and a public key. You would hold on to that private key yourself, your eyes only, but share the public key with everybody else. Okay? RSA, uh, which stands for the first letter of the last names of the people who uh, invented it uh, and built a company off of. RSA is a public key crypto system. Now the new sort of fancy elliptic curve crypto, which used to be patented for decades, and a lot of it still is, but some patents are expiring. Others have been developed independently that are patent free. Uh, ECC is showing a lot of promises in the crypto community. It's another public key crypto system. If you've heard of DSA, the Digital Signature Algorithm, that only applies to signatures itself, like SHA-1 or SHA-256. It only signs things, doesn't do any encryption, but it is a public and private key signature algorithm. Uh, there's some others more obscure, like LGAML, if you've heard of that, uh, and some more. So let's look at how encryption and decryption work then. Encryption and decryption, a magnetic eraser, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. Well, maybe not ever. Tonight, at least. <laughs> that's kind of fun. All right. Um, we'll have two people. Say, here's Aaron. And sorry, Steve, I'm going to pick on Victor. All right. No Alice and Bob. I don't like Alice and Bob. Alice and Bob, for those who aren't aware, are very 
commonly chosen names in the crypto community because Alice starts with A, B starts with Bob, or Bob starts with B. Uh, and then there might be a malicious third party. Her name is Eve, you know, short for evil. I don't, I think it's kind of corny. <laughs> I'd rather use more real life names. So, but do it. There's a Wikipedia article on it. Of course there is. Do a Google search for Alice and Bob. You'll be entertained, I promise. All right. So I'm going to generate, now I can use my red, uh, a private key. I'll put an A in there because that's mine. And then a public key, which will be black. Right? And Victor will do the same. Put a V in his. Right. So now I wish to encrypt something to Victor. So only Victor can see it, nobody else can. I need something that Victor has that I can get a copy of without compromising any integrity. That would be his public key. So he'll share that with me and I'll get a copy of it. And the same is true for me sharing my public key with him. Right? Typically these are stored in what's called a public key ring. It's basically a large file that contains everybody's public keys. That's one way to do it, not the only way, but it's a popular way. And you could also have a secret key ring if you have multiple private keys. <coughs> All right, so now I have a copy of Victor's key. He's got a copy of mine. I wish to encrypt a message to Victor. So I have my plain text. I will apply Victor's public key to the plain text. And that will get me the ciphertext. Okay. If Victor wants to decrypt it, he applies oops, his private key to get back to that original plain text. That makes sense? I have his public key. I can encrypt it to him using his key. He's the only one that should have access to that private key. Nobody else should have it. So as a result, he'll use this to decrypt the ciphertext into the plain text. And the reverse would be true if he wanted to send me a reply. He would encrypt with my public key, send it to me. I would decrypt it with my private key. That makes sense? So, ah. So this is, again, a kind of fun little visual of what I just explained. Any questions on how that works? All right. So let's go to signatures and verification. Signatures, like we talked with the Mac tags, signatures are a way to cryptographically sign data, I'm good, uh, to create a fingerprint of the data, if you will. Right. With public key cryptography, usually identities are associated with the keys. Uh, if any of you have a PGP key or uh, if you use GPG and use a GPG key, you'll have a key that has your name probably and your email address, maybe a comment, maybe you have a few keys, a few email addresses. Identities are usually associated with public key crypto. So when somebody signs data, what happens is that data now becomes uh, non-repudiated, which is kind of a fun word. It basically says that I cannot claim to be somebody, uh, somebody else. Well, I guess I could claim that. The data that was signed was signed with this key. There's no way around it. Okay? Uh, so if you went to like a court of law, for example, and you signed a document, if you physically signed it, you're saying, I signed this. Provided your signature is difficult to forge, you could say with high degrees of probability, yes, Aaron Topont signed this document. That is his signature. We apply the same aspect to cryptography. When I digitally sign data, that public or that uh, yeah, the public private key, the public key cryptography system that was used to sign it had my identity attached to it. <coughs> So out comes a signature with my identity in the signature. So when you look at the data and you look at the signature, if the data, again, re 
signed matches that signature, you can say, yes, this was definitely signed with Aaron Topance's key with high degrees of probability. Okay? That's, that's how this works. But it's a little bit different. Let's say now I have my plain text message. And not only do I want to encrypt it, but I also want to sign the encrypted result. Okay? So when he receives it, he can verify and say, yep, this definitely came from Aaron Topance's key. There's no ambiguity about it at all. Okay? So in that case, for the signature, so this is the encryption, I'm going to add the signature, but I sign it with my private key. Make it bigger. So you can see my initial. Because I want to say this was signed by my key. I should, be the only, I should be the only one able to make that declaration, so I should be able to use something that only I have access to. That would be my private key. The result, the signature would be maybe appended to the ciphertext, right? When Victor receives this, he'll go ahead and separate the two. Here's the ciphertext. Here's that signature. We already know he uses his private key to decrypt it. We're aware of that. But what does he do to verify the signature? Well, he's also going to take this ciphertext and he'll hash it with my public key. Because he wants to verify it came from me. All right? So he'll hash it. If that matches using my key, the signature, We'll get a new sig here. I know it's a mess. Yes, I'll look blue. If these signatures match, it was definitely signed with my key. Make sense? So the signature is signed with my private key and verified with the public. A little bit different than the encryption where it's encrypted with the public and decrypted with the private. Right. So, visually, message is signed with the private key, and then the signature is verified with the public key. Questions on that? Yeah, so the question was, uh, okay, okay. Yeah, so usually there's a lot of metadata associated with uh, the ciphertext and the signature. Uh, in the signature, it will say signed with this key. So when you dig into your key ring, you don't have to go through a thousand <laughs> keys to figure out which one did the signature. It'll just say, this signature was signed with this fingerprint. You look through your public key to find that key with that fingerprint and then apply the ID. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? All right. So let's look at the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. The Diffie-Hellman key exchange is a public-private key key exchange. But it's kind of interesting. Um, this is kind of the algorithm. I think it looks a lot better visually, so I'm just going to jump to that. It looks like a buckets of paint. Okay, Alice and Bob. I'm using Alice and Bob here. You don't know who I'm going to be talking to. So Alice and Bob share a common public value. It could be anything, and it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter if anyone else picks it up. Well, actually, it turns out it does. Uh, that's a discussion for another time. But let's say they both agreed on the paint yellow. Now they're each going to generate their own private secret and they'll, enc they'll encrypt, they'll mix their paint with their secret and that will come a different color. In the case of Alice, she had an orange secret, she got some sort of tan color. 
uh, Bob had a cyan secret, he got more of a blue. Okay. Now, because these are secret, I can successfully send these across the wire, this paint. I can send blue paint and pink paint across the tubes and not worry about having that be a problem. So Alice will have the blue, I'll have her tan, and now I'm going to mix my paint color or encrypt it again with my own secret. And that will give me this lovely brown. And she'll do the same and she'll end up with the same lovely brown. Okay? As a result, we now have a common secret where I can start encrypting messages with this paint. So what's interesting that you might notice already is, wait a minute, I thought you said this was a public-private key system. It is. We have the public portion here and the secret portion here. But when we're done, we end up with the symmetric key, don't we? One interesting thing with symmetric versus asymmetric cryptography is asymmetric cryptography is expensive to encrypt and decrypt. It's slow. And for things like a HTTPS session or an SSH session or a VPN session, we don't want slow, right? We want to make things as quick as possible for the user. Symmetric cryptography, on the other hand, is much more per uh, performing. I don't want to say performant because that's not a word, and I hate it when people use it. Performs much better, right? So we end up with this common secret that we both agree on. We're going to use this as a symmetric key to do our encryption from here on out. Okay? This can be used in SSH, this can be used in VPNs, this can be used in IPsec, it can be used in Kerberos, whatever. So that's how the Diffie-Hellman key exchange works. Any questions on that? And by the way, this is very likely what you will be using when you connect with an uh, encrypted connection. In fact, it's either going to be this or what's known as the RSA key exchange, which is a little bit different, but you end up with a similar result. You'll either use the RSA key exchange or the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. And I don't think I explained the RSA. I don't. Let me explain the RSA key exchange. I'll use green. <coughs> I just realized I probably should have added this to the slides, but that's all right. That's what whiteboards are for. So the RSA key exchange um, Aaron, Victor. Right. I'm going to have a public and private key pair, right? I will send this public portion to Victor. Let's say connect to an HTTPS server. You're already familiar with SSL certificates. They come in a public and private key portion, right? So let's say I am the Apache web server. I have delivered the public SSL portion of that certificate to Firefox, okay? In fact, that might even be better. Let's do that. Apache, Firefox. So this is step one. Step two is Firefox will generate a secret. Okay? And he will encrypt it. with that public portion, right? And we'll get some sort of ciphertext junk, right? So step two is sending that to me. It's safe to do, it's ciphertext. Anyone can get the public, whatever, uh, and you can send a ciphertext through and not worry about a compromise. Okay. I now have this private. Remember how I do the public and private key decryption? I apply that private key to get back to the secret. Now look, both sides have the same agreed secret. From this point, I can use this as a symmetric key and do my encryption and decryption with that 
secret. Make sense? So when you're doing a key exchange on the internet with a secure destination, you'll either use the RSA key exchange, usually shortened as KEX, or the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Question. If somebody is there in between, uh, if they changed it, uh, so Apache will not know the exact secret. Yeah, so let's say we have a malicious third party uh, that intercepts this, yes. right? Reroutes it, yes. sends something else. Yes. If, so the question is, is this possible? The answer is yes. If you didn't do authentication with the ciphertext. Remember that? Remember how we did Mac tags? If you don't have any authentication applied to your ciphertext, this becomes a very real problem. And it's a problem here, and it's a problem here. You're Steve? Also, you have to authenticate that the public key, doesn't that assume that the public key is authenticated? Well? Yeah, so the browser is going to go off and do some checks with certificate authorities and its internal certificate store to make, yeah, definitely. Yep. Which is because if you did do that, then a third party put their own public key in, and then intercept it on the way back. To the Correct. If you're doing no authentication here as well, you have this man in the middle problem also. Yep. This is a, when you not, are not doing authentication, things become a big problem. Yeah. Since the Apache has a type key to decrypt these um, keys or the secret. Uh huh. If there was a man in the middle attack, the Firefox browser wouldn't be able to read what the server sends back. Correct. But the Firefox doesn't know that. Right? Well, Fi Firefox sends it off. Let's say Eve. She'll send an ACK back. Yep, got it. We're good. And send her malicious portion off to Apache. Apache can't decrypt it. You're absolutely right. Apache can't decrypt it. But Firefox doesn't know that. Firefox tries again. The same problem. Right? You've successfully hijacked someone's connection with RSA. With Diffie-Hellman, it becomes more problematic. With Diffie-Hellman, you can actually... Uh, let's move to Diffie-Hellman. So here we have... Alice, Eve, and Bob. When I agree on that common paint, Eve gets a copy. Each generate their own secrets. Then when Alice tries to send the generated portion across, Eve takes it and doesn't send it further. She generates her own portion and sends it to Bob. Bob tries to send to Alice, but Eve intercepts it and keeps it, and then sends a different portion to Bob. What have you successfully done? Eve can now encrypt or decrypt all the communication from Alice and all the communication from Bob, and Alice and Bob are none the wiser. So with Diffie-Hellman, it's even more poisonous if there's no authentication. If you have authentication, this doesn't work. So, yes, that becomes an interesting, an interesting problem. Are we coming back to RSA or are we coming to Diffie-Hellman? RSA. All right. So in the case of um, RSA, Firefox will also generate a public-private key set and send off the public portion to Apache. Then from this point... Um, Trying to think, what is the secret? I'll have to get back to you on that. There's a step here that I'm missing. It might actually be my slides. Let's hold on to that thought. If not, I'll have to get back to you. Yeah. Hold on to that thought. Okay, any other questions before we move on? As, as a, oh, a proxy? Um, yeah, so proxies, if you're, okay, so Alice is connecting to a proxy to talk to Bob. 
then the proxy can decrypt all the communication. So the key exchange happens between the proxy and Alice? Correct. No, it would happen between Alice and the proxy and then the proxy and Bob. Yep. I, I don't know of a way to do a fully transparent proxy where the proxy isn't talk isn't somehow intercepting the data. That's the whole point of the proxy, right? So there may be some, I'm just not familiar with it. Now, other questions? But that can only work if you're not, if Bob and Alice aren't authenticating each other. Right. Well, so now we're getting into end-to-end -end encryption. And that's kind of a, that was my second talk. If, say this was a mail server. Here's my email address and the second email address. When I send off a regular email, even though I'm encrypted between my laptop and the mail provider, the mail provider needs to decrypt it, store it on its storage server. And then when Bob wants to retrieve the email, maybe that communication is encrypted, but on the server itself, it's decrypted. It is at one point or another. So to bypass that, I encrypt the entire message first using maybe Bob's public key, then communicate with the mail server to send the message off. So my encrypted message gets encrypted with TLS, but gets decrypted again and it's still encrypted garbage, right? So now we're getting into end-to-end -to -end encryption, which is a separate topic. Yeah. And there are some fun end-to-end -end stuff related to that. Okay, so let's look at the SSL handshake. Uh, this is basically RS, the RSA key exchange. Uh, SSL handshake, we'll use Diffie-Hellman or um, RSA. But as you can see, the server sends the public cert. The client verifies and authenticates the certificate. Yes, this is definitely from the server. I trust it, whatever. It's not self-signed. I generate the secret, encrypt it, send the result off. The server decrypts it and uses that as the symmetric key, as we explained here. All right, so let's look at the SSL versions. Uh, let's start with SSL 1.0, developed by Netscape in 1993. It was never actually released. The reason why it wasn't released is uh, Vint Serve, Vint, Vince, the father of the internet. Why can't I say his name right now? Vince Cert, Surf, what's his last name? Surf. Him. He's sitting in the presentation at Netscape about SSL 1.0. During the presentation, he successfully compromises it. The presentation's not over and SSL 1.0 is broken. <laughs> so it didn't get released. <laughs> Uh, but here are some interesting uh, tidbits about it. Uh, there is actually no data integrity, no signature algorithms. Later we added the cyclic redundancy check, CRC, to do uh, data integrity. But we know that that doesn't handle authentication. Uh, RC4 was handled primarily for encryption. RC4 is a stream cipher, symmetric stream cipher. Vulnerable to replay attacks, like I said, broken in 10 minutes by Vint Cerf. All right, so this game went back to the drawing board and developed SSL 2.0. This was publicly released, 1994. Um, RSA was the only symmetric encryption algorithm used and MD5 was the only uh, cryptographically secure hashing algorithm used. And at the time, both were secure. Um, in fact, RSA is still considered secure. However, due to what were called the United States Cryptography Export Laws. If you were a developer of cryptography software, you were not allowed to export that software overseas or to another country if it contained greater than 40 bits of encryption strength, 40 bits of entropy. Okay? If you were, you were found guilty of munitions export. Basically, you were a terrorist. Right? Uh, yeah. So SSL 2.0 had what was called this 40-bit export mode. This has plagued us, and so we'll get to that in a second. 
uh, but it also offered internally for non-export, for internal United States use only and for the government, a 128-bit RC2 and 128-bit RC4 uh, symmetric key crypto. Also supported 64-bit DES, that was the standard at the time, so that seems appropriate. 128-bit IDEA, this was interesting. IDEA, uh, it's, it's, I forget what it's short for, it's an algorithm, but it was a patented algorithm. So it was interesting that Netscape decided to use a patented uh, algorithm at that time. 192-bit uh, triple DES, and then for the uh, block ciphers, it used CBC mode only which you saw as a problem with CBC bit flipping attacks, unless the, the message is authenticated. Uh, so some weaknesses, vulnerable to man in the middle attacks, vulnerable to a cipher suite attack, uh, all these sorts of things uh, were problems with SSL 2.0. No certificate chaining. How, how many here have had to deal with certificate chains? With us? Yeah, what a pain in the rear, right? Not fun. Um, at the time, you didn't have to worry about that. Here's a cert, it was signed by Blah, verified, we're good. No, met, no intermediate certificate, none of that stuff. All right, SSL 3.0, released a couple years later due to some flaws in 2.0. Total redesigned and finally standardized in a RFC, RFC 6101. Another typo. Um, they used MD5 and SHA-1 now for the cryptographic algorithms. Both of which, by the way, so MD5 was developed by Ron Rivest, who is the R in RSA. Uh, he also developed RC4 and RC2. Shell 1, however, was developed by NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, say what you like about the NSA and, the, and NIST being in bed together. I'm not one who wholly mistrusts NIST. I think they've done some wonders for the, the cryptographic community. Shell 1 is one of them. Uh, in terms of the symmetric ciphers, supported DES, triple DES, RC4, the same as SSL2. Still had that 40-bit export mode uh, because that hasn't been reverted yet. Backward compatible, fully backward compatible with 2.0. Finally, we have cert chaining. Then we have some interesting key exchanges. Now we support the RSA, Diffie-Hellman, and this <coughs> unheard of and unused uh, key exchange called the Forteza key exchange. It allowed for compression and decompression to get lighter on the wire. Uh, you could specify different cipher suite specifications, but still CBC mode only. <coughs> Weaknesses. Turns out RC4 has some biases, right? For those of you who have to do PCI compliance scans with your company or with your customers, you know that this has been a headache with your PCI vendor, right? They want to get you off of RC4 because of the discovered biases. Uh, CBC was not authenticated. We still were not doing MAC tags, basically. So we had padding Oracle attacks. We had bit flipping attacks. Um, the beast attack, lucky 13 attack, the poodle attack. What's interesting about the poodle attack, so remember how we had this export mode, this 40-bit export? The poodle attack forces a downgrade into 40-bit security because SSL3 supports it, right? That's why that was a problem last year. All right, we moved to TLS 1.0. Despite what you think, TLS 1.0 and SSL 3.0 are different. People like to use them interchangeably. They're not the same. There are some subtle differences. Um, first off and foremost, we now have authenticated CBC. We have MAC tags. This is what you will hear as um, ephemeral Diffie-Hellman. If you see on your uh, cipher suite, EHDH, this is authenticated. Ephemeral Diffie-Hellman. This is authenticated. Uh, an authenticated key exchange, which we want. Um, and again, it was authenticated with either DSA, which I mentioned in passing, or RSA. All right. Interesting with TLS 1.0 is there's actually really, I mean, uh, there's no practical weaknesses except for maybe this, supporting the 40-bit export mode. 
still supports that. But because we have authenticated CVC, uh, it turns out that that isn't a problem. The poodle attack doesn't apply here. Also, because we have hashing algorithms ND5 and SHA-1, uh, we don't really have any known what's called pseudo-random function weaknesses. MD5 or SHA-1 can act as a pseudo-random function, mixing data, uh, being what's called a random oracle for your, your data. A random oracle is, is a theoretical person, theoretical device implementation that would spit out true random numbers, indistinguishable from the most random cosmic noise that you could generate, right? Uh, think of it maybe as like a random god. The goal of cryptography is to emulate that random oracle. So we can use MD5 and SHA-1 as these, these random oracles. Turns out we don't really have any really practical weaknesses uh, with these. And I know you're thinking, oh, wait a minute, there's collision attacks with MD5. You're right, but those are blind collision attacks. Uh, if you have data and an associated signature or hash, digest, there is no known practical attack uh, to discover if you, well, pardon me, you don't have the plain text, you just have the signature. There's no practical attack on MD5 that where you can discover the input that created it. But if you do have them both, there's no practical attack that you can find a second input that creates it. Okay. Uh, this is called a pre-image attack and a second pre-image attack. MD5 is still secure there. Uh, all right. Also, it supports anonymous ciphers. Anonymous ciphers are ciphers that do not support authentication. Okay. Makes sense. Authentication is two parties agreeing on something. Anonymous, there's no one agreeing on anything, basically. All right, TLS 1.1, released 2006, uh, defined in an RFC. We have drop RC2 support. Turns out RC2 was pretty weak. We added SHA-256 to our hashes, and we added AES. AES was standardized in 2001, so uh, that got added. We have authenticated CBC, and now we have explicit initialization vector versus implicit initialization vector. The idea is that I explicitly say, here's the initialization vector uh, to start the process, and I apply that to the ciphertext. So if I were to have, say, like, uh, that does not show up well. If this were my ciphertext, part of it at the front will be the initialization vector, just in plain text. This is an explicit initialization vector. I'm saying, here it is. It's defined as thus. And implicit is calculating the initialization vector based on some deterministic algorithm uh, based on the ciphertext that I receive. Okay? This is stronger than implicit. We changed how we handle padding errors and we supported uh, IANA registration for parameters. With TLS 1.1, there's no real <coughs> flaw. Uh, first off, we dropped, um, I believe, maybe it was in 1.2. Let me look. Okay, it was 1.2. Uh, we still have MD5 support. Some consider that a weakness. We still have DES and RC4 support. Some consider that a weakness. Um, but in all reality, uh, there are no known practical attacks or vulnerabilities with TLS 1.1. We haven't seen any yet. All of them have been TLS 1.0 or SSL 3.0. All right, moving to TLS 1.2, released in 2008. If you're keeping track, this was seven years ago. We've seen pretty consistent TLS and SSL updates up to this point. Now we have this big seven-year gap. Uh, 1.3 has not been released yet. Defined in that RFC, we get rid of the patented idea algorithm, we get rid of DES, we get rid of RC4. So we're dropping what we're considering weak or biased or patented algorithms. We drop 40-bit export mode. Now that that has been released, Bill Clinton uh, released the cryptography export laws back in the late 90s. So that's no longer a problem. Um, now, instead of using MD5 SHA-1 for our pseudo-random function, 
we use SHA-256. Turns out that MD5 has blind collision attack problems. SHA-1 is starting to show some weaknesses. We don't have any practical attacks yet, but all cryptographers are warning it's time to get off of SHA-1. So TLS 1.2 heeded that advice and is now using SHA-256. Um, MD5 is only supported in RSA certificate signatures. So if your certificate is signed by RSA or uh, encrypted with RSA, it can be signed with MD5. We've now mandated support for AES. We've not mandated its use, uh, but we've, AES must be included in all TLS 1.2 cipher suites. Um, now we have an agreement on hash and ciphers, so now I can present a whole slew of cipher suites available to the client. The client can present me with his whole full supported cipher suite list, and we'll pick on a, on a common, we'll make an agreement on, between those two lists. Um, now we've added some new modes. I didn't talk about these modes. Uh, this GCM and CCM mode, these are what are called authenticated block cipher modes, kind of like ECB, CBC, CTR. Uh, but this has built-in authentication. Where previously, like let's say AES CTR, I encrypt some stuff with AES and CTR mode. It doesn't have authentication built in, so I have to do that separately. After I'm done with the encryption, then I have to authenticate it, right? Like the Mac then encrypt. With GCM, it skips that step, or CCM. It's built in. When I go through that mode, I get the confidentiality and I get the authentication at the same time. Okay. So that's part of TLS 1.2. Also, we've mandated that we'll never negotiate SSL 2.0. Uh, no known weaknesses in TLS 1.2, by the way. And PCI compliance 3.1, for those of you who are maintaining that, you will have to be on TLS 1.2 for PCI 3.1 compliance, PCI DSS 3.1. So that's not due until June 30th of 2016 though, so you've got some time to sit on your laurels, but you'll want to start working towards that. TLS 1.3, this is in draft status. Um, some interesting stuff here. We drop compression support. Turns out that compression introduces some interesting attacks, like timing attacks. How long does it take you to decompress the data? Interesting, I can learn something about the ciphertext or learn something about the plain text. Uh, there were some valid attacks, the crime attack and the breach attack on OpenSSL that used compression as the core of their attack. Uh, we, read, we dropped renegotiation support. Um, we dropped non-authenticated ciphers, no more CBC. Everything has to be authenticated now, it's mandated. We drop RSA key exchange and anonymous Diffie-Hellman key exchange. No more anonymous ciphers. All cipher exchanges, key exchanges, must be authenticated. Um, and then we drop backwards compatibility for the entire SSL family, SSL3 and SSL2, and we also drop support for RC4, which means the only cipher we have left is AES. But what's interesting is we have this that was just barely added, and I mean between Open West and now. Cha Cha Poly 1305 is an authenticated block, or actually a stream cipher mode. Yeah. In this case, stream cipher, authenticated stream cipher. Cha Cha 20 is a stream cipher developed by Daniel J. Birdstein, uh, as well as Poly 1305. Uh, this has been already standardized in RFC 7539. It was just recently added to the 1.3 draft. So by dropping RC4, we no longer have a stream cipher. But now adding this in, we do. And it shows that Cha Cha 20 is actually, uh, actually performs better than RC4. So that's kind of exciting. All right. Last couple things, I'll be finished. Any questions on the, by the way, the SSL or TLS history? I know there's a lot there. All right. I've, you only have a few minutes, so. Doran. Um, are there any browsers that are currently supporting the 1.3 draft? Question, are there any browsers that are supporting the 1.3 draft? Not that I know of. 
Uh, with that said, Chrome does support the Cha Cha 20 Poly 1305. Um, OpenSSL, when it had its heart bleed problems back in, was it last year? I think early last year. Um, we had OpenBSD fork the OpenSSL source code and create LibreSSL, right? Google also forked it and created a boring SSL, which I think is awesome. Uh, and they added Cha Cha 20 Poly 1305 to their boring SSL uh, suite. And that's what they use when you negotiate uh, SSL with Google, uh, is their boring SSL suite. And in that suite is Cha Cha 20 Poly 1305. Chrome supports Poly 13, Cha Cha 20 Poly, blah, 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 Poly 1305. Uh, you mentioned that the Cha Cha was a newer algorithm. Yeah. Has it been uh, thoroughly vetted? So I mentioned, the question was, I mentioned Cha Cha 20, a newer algorithm. Has it been thoroughly vetted? Uh, it is definitely newer. Within five years, newer. But not too new. Um, it's to the point, it has been well reviewed, not near as much as RC4AS because they've got time underneath their belt. Uh, but it is getting substantial attention. Daniel Bernstein is a world renowned cryptographer. Um, and I mean, probably short of Ron Rivest to maybe Bruce Schneier, the world's most famous cryptographer. And his ciphers have gotten considerable attention. Uh, so, yeah, there are analysts working on it, and there are no known weaknesses. And it has been out long enough that cryptographers are starting to feel comfortable with suggesting it. So, um, I wouldn't say jump the ship now and start using it. Modern versions of OpenSSH also support Cha Cha 20 Poly 1305. Uh, so, in fact, OpenSSH 7, which just released, I think, last week, makes that the default now. But for older versions, it's still AES. I'd recommend you stick with that. Up to you. But yeah. Answer your question? Cool. All right, last couple slides, and I'll let you go. So OpenSSH. Uh, OpenSSH has an interesting history. It was created by the OpenBSD developers as an alternative to the proprietary SSH by Tatu Yolanin, uh, which I, he's not Finnish. Yeah, anyway, some European. Um, in the early 90s, he created SSH, and then he released it to the Internet Engineering Task Force as a specification. So these developers decided to take the code that was open source by Tattoo at the time and create their own version called OSSH. Tattoo decided he wanted to build a company off of this, and he wanted to make money. He had this revolutionary idea. So he uh, locked up the source code behind a proprietary binary license. Uh, however, the OSSH developers continued developing with their fork following the specification that he released. OpenBSD took OSSH um, and continued to develop that and created OpenSSH as a result. It first appeared in OpenBSD 2.6 in 1999. Then what was interesting is it started becoming really popular. Uh, fast. It spread across the BSDs and then it spilled over to Linux almost instantaneously. Uh, so Tattoo decided to threaten the OpenBSD and the OpenSSH developers with trademark violations, saying you can't use the term, quote, SSH, end quote. That is my trademark. I own it, use something else. And they basically pointed to the open source code that he released as well as the IETF specifications uh, that he released to the public and say basically you just did your own version of Kleenex or Advil. Tough luck, right, or Elevator. Like it, it's now a public term, it's publicly used, it's public domain. Uh, and thankfully it didn't go anywhere. OpenSSH is now defined in all those bazillion RFCs. Um, some concepts. OpenSSH 7.0 just released like last week. So that's kind of fun. Supports all these different ciphers. Cha-Cha 20 now being the new default. Uh, 
supports these different cryptographic hashing algorithms, um, supports these different key exchanges. Uh, ECDH is elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. Diffie-Hellman is based on prime numbers. Uh, with ECDH, this is based on elliptic curves, which is different. Also supports curve 2519 key exchange. This is also a Daniel Bernstein key exchange. You're going to see him pop up a lot in crypto. CBC and ARC4 are disabled by default. ARC4 is a public domain of RC4. When Ron Rivest uh, developed RC4, he didn't release the algorithm, but people reverse engineered it, figured out how RC4 works, so created a public domain version and called it ARC4. Uh, OpenSSH now can be completely built against LibreSSL, no longer requires OpenSSL. Supports Kerberos, supports password and key-based authentication, provides secure FTP, secure copying, tunneling, X11 forwarding. Probably a lot of this you're already familiar with. But what's interesting with the crypto is that it supports, uh, and now the Poly 1305, Mac tags, and those uh, cipher suites. Oh, I didn't do open PGP. Well, that's all right. Any questions? <laughs> Nope. All right. Yeah, again, if you want the slides, come see me afterwards. I'll have no problems giving them to you. Thanks.